Okay, straight into it. Welcome to Back Chat. Thanks to Blue Bet. Thanks to Shelter. Thanks to Whippersnapper. Thanks to Margaret River Roasting Co. We are in the presence of greatness. Uh, one Thanks, of the, man. One of the <laughs> and Dustin Fletcher. And- <laughs> uh, Dustin Fletcher joins us. Uh, we appreciate your time today, mate. One of the one of the all time games record holders in the league. One of five people to play four hundred games. I'm going to start with this stat. Mm-hmm. Has played in front of the most people in AFL VFL history having played in front of 19,298,044 people. Oh, Surely I could have got to 20 million. But, uh, <laughs> Welcome, mate. Yeah, big thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no worries. So I've, well, how, how's that for the start? How do they, how they count them up? I mean, I don't know if that'd be individual people. Well, right? it's like it is. They've it's got 44. They've got it. You know, I just mean, you know, yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah. the first question we ask anyone on back chat, Dustin, I haven't given you any preparation with this, but having heard a bit of your story, I reckon... I know where you're going to go with this. We ask every guest that ever comes on this podcast, what's your greatest sporting achievement? Now, before you answer, you're a great football player. You've played lots of games. You played till you're 50 years old. Congratulations. (laughs) We're here to tell you we do care, but also we We want to know your greatest sporting achievement not on the football field. So you can't tell us the best thing you've done. You've won premierships. You've been a best and fairest, been All-Australian. What's your greatest ever sporting achievement not on the football field? Oh, sporting achievement off the, off the field. Probably a different sport. I actually played a fair bit of tennis growing yes. up. And uh, the claim to fame for me was uh, beating Mark Philippoussis. Um, <laughs> who yes. uh, The Scud pl- missiles. The Scud <laughs> played a bit of tennis. was a good player. And there's a bit to the story, though. 6-4, um, 7-5. I remember the uh, actual scoreline. <laughs> um, but he actually beat me 14 times. But um, I did beat him once uh, back in the day uh, out there at Williamstown. So... Um, tennis was a sport I, you know, enjoyed as a kid and uh, grew up playing. So that was that was probably it. Uh, Andrew Illy was another one. He was you beat him too. I beat him as well. He was in our. They're in actually in our shell squad. So Mark was always number one. Andrew was number two. Myself three. Uh, oh, sorry, two, uh, three. Uh, Joe Siriano who played three Australian Opens yes. and uh, Chris Anstey. Um, me and Chris used to fight it out for uh, the fourth and fifth spot. Dan, Huge. a very big basketball fan. Yeah, Chris Anstey. Yeah, big. the tennis player. Who knew? Did you know? No, I didn't. Did and, but he's got a better claim to fame than me. He's actually never lost to Michael Jordan. Um, <laughs> he actually he played with the Dallas Mavericks and Chicago yeah. Bulls, but uh, he played with Dallas one day against uh, the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan, and actually only played him once, but they beat him. So uh, Undefeated against a, Michael Jordan. That's good. That is Love good, that. yeah. That is good. This question never fails to de- deliver, to be honest. I don't think we've ever had a guess where we're like, oh, that's not very good. Yeah, Benny, it's, me, it's Benny Mark Philippoussis is right up there, I will say that. Yeah, that was good fun. Maybe we, maybe we need the scud on back chat. Well, he's, back in Ma- he's back in Melbourne now. He's living down Barwon Headsway. Is so he? Back in Melbourne and, uh, yeah, he's doing some good things, I think, down there. Okay, very good. So you've played 400 games exactly in the AFL. So there's, there's a little bit of games to get through here, mate. So we're going to try and do a bit of a footy journey for you. We're not going to go through every single one. <laughs> but I can't remember yesterday, let alone... Uh, <laughs> yeah. do, I, I did want to start because, uh, you know, looking at it, you know, some guys have played 420, for, you know, 430, for whatever the number is, but you've played exactly 400. Was it was it orchestrated towards the back end of the career that you were going to play 400? Oh, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, probably not. It's actually 399 and a half because, uh, believe Sorry? it or not, um, I actually got subbed off. It was back when the vest came out and you get subbed off and you were done for the day. And I remember coming in at half time and I was playing, well, I was having a sh- shitty old day. And groins were a bit sore. And I remember saying, I heard he was coach at the time and he sort of looked across at me. And I could tell that look wasn't sort of great. And I sort of jumped in. I jumped in before he said to me, I said, oh, is it the vest time? And he said, oh, I think it's vest time. So, <laughs> in uh, your 400th? In my 400th, yeah. I went into the game a little bit sore and thought I'd get through and did one of those and I wasn't playing well. And, um, and yeah, I was, I was off. But, uh, 399. 399 and a half, but obviously counts as what, what part of the season was that? Was that last game of the, round, of the season? Yeah, no, it wasn't. So it was dream time at the G. Uh, how do I explain it in a nice way? We were probably going through a bit of a tough period with yep. the uh, with the drug saga, and we were in and out. I had a little bit of a sore groin, um, and in the end, it you know it was my last game. I, mentally, I probably yeah you know, I felt a bit of pressure to just get the four hundred done and get it out of the way. And after I played that game, I just sort of relaxed, and I, th- I knew then when I finished playing that game, it was going to be my last. Yeah, well. Mm. Yeah. So and I felt a bit guilty too because a couple of young boys, you know, Tate Pears, Kale Hooker, you know, Michael Hurley were playing and, 
young kids coming through and, you know, I thought I've had my time and let these boys uh, get in there and have a go. Because post that, you then, uh, the suspensions got handed down, is that right? You yeah, yeah, so it was midway, well, 2011, you know, drug starts sort of started, that's when the program started and this was 2015 round, oh, I'm not even sure what round, 10 round, 11, whatever it was and, yeah, I just think mentally I knew then, you know, yeah. I was enjoying things as much as I should, Um Groins were getting a bit sore and, and uh, my time was done. So that's at the end of the career. We're going to get to that later. Let's go right back to the early 90s. You drafted in 92, the end of 92. Yep. And your first season is 93. Big season for you. Big season. Didn't expect it. At, you know, like any probably young kid playing, I signed up. Western drafted me under the father and son rule, so dad played enough games for me to be drafted. Kevin Sheedy basically said, oh... We're not sure about you. We're going to draft you, but we're not sure. We'll give you a year and we'll see if you can put some weight on and, and play. Thank, thanks for the confidence, Thanks Kev. for the confidence, <laughs> Kev. Um, and what happened, they, Essendon were going to be really good. They, were, they said, get your schooling done. I was still obviously doing my VCE. Get your schooling done. Play school footy. Um, play your eight to ten games of school footy. And then, you know, back half of that year, we'll give you 10 or 12 VFL reserve games. And that was going to be 1993. But, um, yeah, it's a little bit different. It started a little bit different. Well, so what, what, what changed? Because you... You play in a premiership in 93. Yeah, I did. So what happened, uh, well, you all know Joe Danaher, Joe's father, Anthony, was sort of coming to the end, was a little bit sore. Um, there was no real um, sort of anyone to go in the back line, really, and it was by chance that I went there. My first game was actually in the ruck. Sheed said to me on the phone, he rang up Thursday night, Sheed's on the after match committee. Um, it was about half past 12. He had a few red wines, I think, and <laughs> mum actually answered the phone. I was in bed, so I had school the next day. <laughs> And said, oh, he's Dustin there. And mum said, oh, he's in bed. He's got school the next day. So <laughs> You're calling it. Um, can I speak but, to and he said to mum, mum oh, he's, he's, Dustin's going to play this week. And um, so I found out the Friday morning. And So she uh, didn't wake you up? She didn't even wake me up. She just waited till I woke up the next day and said, are you going to play? Um, I did speak to Sheeds in the morning and he said, same story. Don't get too excited. You're going to start on the bench. Um, we'll get you on a forward line, back line. We'll see how we go. And... As it worked out, I got into the game. Uh, mum drove me in. Um, didn't have my licence. Oh my um, God. Dad was coaching school footy, so he didn't take me in. Mum drove me in and did all the pre-game. I was starting on the bench. So I was actually wasn't I was actually quite relaxed about it. Like, believe it or not, you know, big game against Carlton in front of, I think, 88,000 in the end. But um, So we ran out, and I had the tracksuit top on down the end of the race, and uh, Kevin Sheedy waves me down. And I thought he was going to tap me on the ass and say, good luck, enjoy it. You know, it's a big crowd, have a bit of fun. And he said, nah, he said, we've uh, changed things up here. And I said, oh, what do you mean, change things up? Um, he said, we've got Paul Salmon, who was our gun ruckman. You know, Paul Salmon being a, a pretty good player. We've moved him to uh, full forward, and you're going to go in the ruck. I said, fuck, going in the ruck. <laughs> I was six foot five, 79 kilos, and I was rucking against a guy by the name of Justin Madden. Oh. And the Madden name was for me with the Essen Footy Club, his brother Simon, a games record holder, and Justin had played big left arm ruckman. Um, and I thought, geez, I've got to get up and try and get my hand on this ball. And I got over the top of him in my first hit out, hit straight to Greg Williams, obviously plays for Carlton. Perfect. He shot the handball to Craig Bradley, two bounces, bang. Stephen Kernahan takes a mark in the forward <laughs> line. They kick a goal. <laughs> and uh, I never play in the ruck again. So, <laughs> so I was absolutely wrapped. But yeah, that was my first game. And the season went really well. Played 17 games through that year. It was the year of the baby bombers. Tim Watson out of retirement. And um, we won a premiership. What was that like to win a premiership in your first year? Was it, you know, you, you just said you're out of, you're effectively in school doing VCE and you, you're winning your flag. Was it real? Like, did you understand it at that moment uh, what you'd done? Yeah, you, you probably understand it, but you don't. Like, I remember coming into school, you know, you know, most, most, you know, after Saturday, most games were Saturday afternoon. You knew when you were playing and you'd go into school on the Monday and I had some tough, you know, I, I have to say I wasn't up to AFL standard when I, you know, the guys I played on my first year, they were some big names, you know, Dunstall, Lockett, Ablett, Modra, Sumich, Carey, Longmire, Hogg, they were all, Just a few. they were big names, and I'd never played fullback in my life <laughs> as well, like it was always school footy was full forward or centre forward, so right. I enjoyed, you know, kicking a goal, but um, but you get into school on the Monday morning, usually after having a pretty, pretty tough day at the office, and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, your mates to give it to you, the teachers to give it to you, but by sort of recess, you're actually feeling all right about yourself. You're just back at school. So I, I, I knew what the occasion was like, but um, I just sort of didn't take it as serious as I probably should, and I was back at school the next day. So After winning the flag? After winning the flag. So I didn't... Um, I oh, got the Mad Monday in, got the Saturday, su Saturday night, Sunday... Mum gave you Monday off? Yeah, Monday, got the Mad Monday in, and then I was coming into exams, so... Yeah, it was like a week or two, you know, later, and and we had exams to do. So, 
Yeah. How were you balancing? Like, were you, were you doing schoolwork or were you... Like uh, yeah, I was. It's, it was a lot different to, you know, what you see now. Like, it was, you know, training was really just Monday, Tuesday, Thursday nights. Um, six o'clock we'd start. We'd train, you know, you'd train quite late, do your weights. You'd be in the gym at eight o'clock doing your weights, half past eight. You wouldn't get be getting home t- to late. And Bomber Thompson lived out in Greenvale too, so um, I used to get a lift home with Bomber every uh, every night, which was... Which was good, but a lot different to what you see now. Yeah, guys had jobs. You know, there were plumbers, electricians, school teachers, all that type of stuff, and I was just at school. So, how, how does the you know you played for twenty two years, uh, most in the history of the AFL in terms of time spent on lists? How does the cumulative journey look as a backman? So you, you didn't play back as a junior, but then you playing full back as a kid in a grand final to. 2015 when you retire you don't have those one-on-one battles with Lockett in the goal square towards that middle part of your career it's like a zoning defense do you sort of look back and see how much things changed over the journey as a backman oh no no footy's a lot I shouldn't say but I will but footy's a lot easier I felt footy my last so we'll say half my last sort of 11 years I felt footy was easier than it was early days not that I'm not saying it's better you know it was better or, or worse but I felt like when I first started, you know, I'd be lucky to get outside of the 25 metres, you know, I'd, you'd, you'd rarely get outside 50 because it was, you know, it was, and I remember Jason Dunstall for some reason, it was myself and Jason Dunstall in the goal square and he'd clear everyone out and every forward did it, they'd clear everyone out. They had full reign in the forward line and you had to battle like hell for for two hours, you know what I mean, just to try and stop a lot of these guys. Every contest was one-on-one, you didn't have guys floating over the top taking him. every now and then you did but it was uh, it was pretty tough did you know you, I, I look I like the Carey Jakovic you probably you know yeah. they're one-on-ones you see I'm not so, I'm not saying I beat these guys but even getting you know just sort of getting half you know, halving contest was was a massive win did you go into games you know against these superstar forwards kicks a thousand thousand goals in their career did you go in almost accepting that you'd have goals kicked against you yeah I did yeah no oh, you probably shouldn't but I, I think I did um you know Gary Ablett Oh, you know, Alan Jakovic, you forget about the two or three years he had kicking sort of 95, 96 goals. And Is that Melbourne? Yeah, Melbourne. Yeah, yeah so I've... And, uh, well, Alan Jakovic one day kicked nine, stra- nine goals, one on me at the MCG. <sighs> I did not get moved. I remember coming in at half time and looking at Sheed saying, well... Is something got to give here or, <laughs> yeah, or help? And he said, oh, he goes, no, nah, we're still winning, so you'll be staying there. So, yeah, it was tough. And, you know, I think having sort of Sheeds, who was very positive towards me and positive person and, and my sort of dad too saying, you know, Gary Abbott Senior kicked, he kicked six on me and a half one day and, again, looked at Sheeds and said, well, is something got to give here? And he said, mate, we're still winning, so you're going to stay there. So, yeah, it was tough, um, very tough, but... I never took footy too seriously, especially when I was still at school. So I think that helped with with all that sort of all that process. What was the biggest bath? What was what was the biggest hiding you had? It was nine straight, nine goals, one. Alan Jakovic at the MCG. So never had ten kicked on you. Uh, never ten. Um, you know, I think I got moved. I, well, I probably at some stage would have got ten kicked on me, but I did get moved yeah. moved a few times. But um, well, Mark Lacroix, I think kicked. He played that game. Twelve kicked twelve. When I reckon um, you wouldn't have spent any time. I, with him. You would have been handing him over I, to the other boys. Yeah, yeah, I reckon I had him. I was about third go on him, and he kicked. I reckon he got three on me, but uh, he, had, he had a day out that day, and I remember just. Every time he got it, bang goal, you know, bang goal. It was just one of those days where he, he was on. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned your old man. He played over two hundred games for Essendon. So I mean, your 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 life has been with the Essendon Footy Club. Yeah, right? we, well, we just had a hundred and fifty year um, sort of celebration. You know, the last couple of weeks down there at uh, down there back home in Melbourne, and um, I was born in seventy five. Dad started playing footy at Essendon sixty eight, and played through to about nineteen eighty. So. You know, for me, from 1975, you know, I was born, you know, I was at the footy with mum, we used to go, you know, every week, and um, so from 1975 through to, you know, really present day, that's been my my workplace, uh, mates, friends, it's been my life really, so, what, 22 plus, you know, I've been there a long time. Do you feel that connection like do you feel like Essendon is like Dustin Fletcher you connect you connect yeah I do and I think just w- once I finished once I finished playing I reckon you f- really feel the connection with supporters a little bit more like you know they always remind you of different things and and it's not only that you know these guys pay a lot of money for their memberships and you un- I understood probably when I finished the game what it did mean to people and 
that's probably the thing I uh, I sort of look at now and think, you know, the supporter base is, is unbelievable. Uh, unlike some players, you played a long time in the game. You went through quite a few coaches. I don't know how many exactly you had, but Kevin Sheedy, you go down as one of the great coaches of all time. Talk to us about him. It, it came across externally as weird. Yeah, no, no doubt. I still don't understand him. But uh, <laughs> he did come across very, uh, very positive, uh, love people, love football, um, all those things. So for me, and I, I actually knew Sheeds from, you know, I'd been there a long time. So I, I sort of knew Sheeds in a way that probably maybe a few other guys didn't. I could go and sit in his office and have a cup of tea or a coffee and sort of listen, you know, fully understand what he was on about. But I could, <laughs> I could do that. Whereas other guys, you know, mightn't be able to do that. But probably summing Sheeds up, I remember we had a, a very bad loss to the Sydney Swans. It might have even been that, uh, that prelim final where we lost by a point. We were three goals up with five minutes to go, up there in Sydney, should have won the game. Was that Lockett kicks after the siren? Lockett kicked a point yeah. after the siren, um, I think it was. And Sheeds was always pretty good with his spray. When I say pretty good with his, his sprays, he'd sort of just do it as a group. He didn't really individualise, but we came off the ground that day and Sheeds came in the rooms and I could tell he was, he was up and about. He was angry. He was hitting things, you know, on the way. And he, he just, he went Went around and got um, he got twenty two seats out. No, oh, it's twenty seats back then. It was only two on the bench. Twenty seats out and put them in a circle. And I remember he had to go at every single person. And I went for about half an hour, forty minutes, from <laughs> myself to Joe Masidi to Mark McCurry. You know, Fletcher, why weren't you on him? Mickey Simons, you should have been back spoiling. You know, you were shit house today. Everyone copped it. And Steve Alessio was our ruckman sitting next to me. Um, and Sheeds didn't like uh, he didn't like the private school boys because they had it too easy. If yes. you're a plumber, Sparky, he loved you. But anyway, Sess and or Ruckman, he didn't like Ruckman. <laughs> so he started on Sess, and Sess copped the biggest spray of all time. And he, it took Sess's spray about five or ten minutes in the ruck, <laughs> duck in your head. You oh, nineteen guys oh, are just watching. Sess copped it. He was the last. Anyway, it, it sort of finished, and we were you know we were flat because we could have been in the grand final the next week. And I remember Sess getting up and looking at me. I could tell in his eyes he was he was. He was flat. Um, and he said to me, he said, can you believe the spray I just copped? And I said, mate, we all copped it. Just, you know, get on with it. Um, <laughs> but he said, uh, mate, I didn't even, sex actually did not even play. <laughs> he, was the, uh, he was actually the 21st. So what, what she used to do is, is get, get a bloke out there early before the game t- to try and fool the opposition and say, we're going to play another Ruckman. Right. But he still had his track suit. He still had his track suit on. So he sort of looked like he'd played and... <laughs> He got the biggest spray of all and actually didn't even play. So uh, Sheeds was in a bit of a zone that uh, that particular day. Oh, that is very good stuff. So what year was that? That was, a pre- that was after a prelim. What that, year was that? 96. 96. Yeah, 96. So I was four years in the system. And again, 93, we got one. But uh, well, losing grand finals is tough. But losing prelims in a way hurts more because we lost 96 by a point, 99 by a point. And uh, wow. you don't get a chance. You don't get a a crack at the big show, you know what I mean? And you, you, you probably could win it, but you're not there, so. So, yeah, so 99, you lose by a point. 2000, though, um, I've heard you speak about that as as one of the best years and best groups you played with. Y- yeah. You, looking at that year, right, that finishes in a premiership for the team. You win the best and fairest, 2000, So and, and you're All-Australian. So a big year for you as well. To win a best and fairest in a premiership year, you must look back at a long period of time as, as your best? Yeah, I think so. When you retire and you've done all, you know, you've finished and done. And Gary O'Donnell, I think, won the best and fairest in 1993, the Crichton medal. So whenever we get together, he always reminds me, you know, we're the two best footballers <laughs> going around. But um, but I think 2000 came from 99. We lost by a point. And I remember we finished that that particular game and we sat down and she'd said, oh, you guys don't book holidays. You're not going away yet. You know, you, you boys are going to sit down and watch watch the, 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 uh, the grand final. And we thought we were going to, you know, watch it. And uh, we went uh, 12 o'clock. We had to beat the MCG. This is 99 grand final. We just lost the prelim. And he said, um, and Sheed was there in the room. And we had like a pre-match meeting. And uh, we walked across to the uh, MCG. We had 22 seats up the top of the southern stand. And we sat there and watched the whole game. Wow. North Melbourne, who we hated, they were, well, I shouldn't say hate, it's a tough word, but they were always close. You know, they were a neighbouring suburb and obviously Carlton were in that grand final. So we walked across as a group. Um, you can imagine the crowd giving it to us. In, and in, in, uh, not in gear, just in casual gear. Yeah. But um, but we did go and sit and watch. And the whole reason behind the game finished, we went we went back across the road to our meeting room and we sat there again. And she would said, uh, well, that's just what you missed out on. And um, from uh, from that day, I think the boys went away thinking, well, 
you know, we've got to get one soon. And uh, and that started 2000, just a great year. We had some tough tough guys in that side, you know, Solomons, uh, Johnsons, um, you know, Paul Barnard, you know, Dean Wallace. It was just a, Damien, it was a tough, tough side. So average winning margin, I think, was 36 points, 38 points. So every time we turned up, we were we were winning games of footy and we just lost that one to the Bulldogs um, towards the end of the year. But uh, that was the only one we lost. Yeah. Did you did you feel like you had to lose one in the season? Is there that sort of feeling like we got to get one out of the way so it's not like the final game of the season? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, it, oh, how do I actually answer that? I think you know where I'm getting at here. Well, I actually lost that game for us. Um, <laughs> I actually uh, kicked the ball out in the full with about a minute to go, and Chris Grant swung around and kicked a left foot goal for him to to win the game. So I say yes, we had to leave that <laughs> one because I didn't want to go through the season undefeated and lose the grand final. But it was also the game, too, where uh, Kevin Sheedy, um, Terry Wallace was coaching the Bulldogs, and it was the first time we've really seen the heaviest flood of all time. He just literally put, you know, 18 plays behind the ball and just stopped us scoring. So I blame Kevin Sheedy. Um, I said, you're our coach, Sheeds, that day. Um, and he blames me for kicking out in the full. But uh, I th- deep down, I think it was a loss that didn't worry us, really, because... Uh, Mate, imagine going through the season undefeated yeah. and, and losing the big one. But we could have won it. I'm not sure. We were a good enough side to probably win it. But uh, I thought it was a bit of a monkey off the back early and we could concentrate on the final series. And But I think the other thing was, too, we our fitness guy, John Quinn, who was, came from athletics background, we started the season off, so we had a really good start to the 2000 season. He said to us after about round four, he said to, I remember saying to Herdy in the leadership, or the leadership, I wasn't in the leadership group, but he said, how come you're singing the song after every game? He said, you haven't, you haven't really won anything, you know what I mean? You've won a game, you've got to go next week, you'll do the same thing. He said, why wouldn't you just sing the song after you win the grand final? And we didn't sort of think too much of it by, I think, about, by, by round six. We actually didn't even sing the song. So from round six of that 2000 season through to the grand final, we didn't sing the song once after a game. Really? Right? We were just pretty focused and, you know, we probably sung it at the bloody nightclubs like a... <laughs> made up for it. Made up for it. But, yeah, we didn't sing the song until uh, we made a bit of a pact and it worked out that way. It would have been a bit sad if we sort of didn't win it. But uh, So we didn't sing the song that year from, from about round six, well, uh-huh. yeah, which is a bit different, but... Is that driven by because Sheeds is your coach then still right? Yeah, is that co- is that sort of driven by him? He just seemed like a guy that would come up not these crazy ideas, but he seems like he's been a real innovator in that sort of stuff. Like I've never heard a team doing that before, really. Yeah, oh, I think it, well, it wasn't his idea, but when John Quinn and the players yeah. said we're not singing the song, he was all for it. He goes, "Oh, well, I can understand it, so don't sing it." So it was simple as that, but. And he was different, you know. He had the marshmallow game and the Martians and and all these type of different. Yeah, the, the scarf thing with and, West Coast, right? And yeah. the scarf yeah. thing going and and he was just an innovator, like you know the the and you go to Anzac Day, you know what I mean? Nineteen ninety five and Anzac Day was a it was a day where you know shops were shut, there was no footy, you know the dawn service. It was a massive day for. Our return, you know, servicemen, and he knew that, um, you know, Bruce Ruxton was a was a he was head of the RSL. He was a Collingwood man, and she sort of thought, that, "Why can't we play footy on Anzac Day?" You know what I mean? Yes, we're going to make it. You know, football's there, Anzac Day's there, but why can't we play footy? So he rang Bruce Ruxton and said, "I think we can work this. Essendon Collingwood Anzac Day. If we're going to raise a lot of money for our return servicemen, we can do it." And in the end, 1995, first Anzac Day game, uh, it was a lockout. Uh, the gate shut at 1.30. It was a Tuesday afternoon um, and we got a drawn game of footy and, you know, money raised. Not only about the money raised for, for, for the Anzacs, but it was about recognition. You know, our kids in school now, they go to school and a lot of the kids know about Anzac Day. Yes, there's football on Anzac Day, but they know what Anzac Day is about for, uh, for the other reasons. And it was a draw, wasn't it? It was a draw. The um, first Anzac Day clash. It was a draw. Uh, I'll put myself back in it again. <laughs> I, did, I reckon I had about seven kicked on me. Um, Severo <laughs> Rocker had a day out. Um, and from memory, Nathan Buckley, I think, could have nearly won the game. He was running through the centre, took a bounce. Um, it was a beautiful kick, Nathan Buckley. Could have probably kicked a 50, 60 metre goal or even a point to win it. But he went to Severo Rocker, who was on fire. And I did get one spoil in, and that was probably the last spoil. But it was a drawn game, so... To have a drawn game, Anzac Day, you never like playing in draws, but this just felt like it, it meant something. You know, not, too, not so much Eston Collingwood, but it meant something to the, the footy world and for what uh, you know, people had done for us. Yeah, like that, almost like there shouldn't be a winner. Like yeah, it was that's a, right. Yeah. And, and it right. was just weird. Like a Tuesday afternoon at the MCG, and I remember the lines, they, they, they panicked a little bit because there so many people actually had gone to the game. I think there was still room to let people in, but there was that many people that got there early to see the pre-game. 
all that type of stuff. And Sheeds was great. We used to go into the dawn service. I remember 1995, that first day. We were up at 5 o'clock. We went to the dawn service. Pre-game. Pre-game. And we were playing in that uh. day. So he didn't. Well, he wasn't too fussed about that. He just thought, you've got to understand what this is about. And every young player now goes to the dawn service. Um, maybe not, you know, if you're playing match day, but uh, they'll have to go, yeah. That's good, isn't it? Um, you've played in a lot of big games, a lot of Anzac Day games, grand finals, premierships. Um, one that springs to mind, though, for mine that a lot of people will know is is that is that line in the sand game, the big rivalry between Essendon and Hawthorne. Um, big brawl in the middle of the ground, people smacking on. You know, we had the demolition derby over here in the West, but that Hawthorne-Essendon game kind of, it was right at my prime footy-watching age. I was mid-teens and yeah. it was just like, how good is this? But you're out in the middle. Yeah, Were you, were you out there laying punches or oh, what were you doing out there? Yeah, well, I can't fight, but um, <laughs> I was pretending to, to get out there and, and let a few go. But my first sort of thought was, I remember, and again, you know, this probably came from Kevin Sheedy, 83 grand final, which we lost, you know, record loss, 84, 85. Some of the fights that we did have with Hawthorne were, you know, I knew about because I was, I was an Essendon person. So, and Sheedy, yeah, we... You know, between uh, I sort of feel sort of North Melbourne because I was a bit of a neighbour and we didn't like each other. But Hawthorne was the one that we hated, and hates we didn't hate you don't hate anyone, but uh, we disliked uh, Hawthorne. So I knew about all that type of stuff, and I remember it started, it kicked off, um, and I, and I you know looking back on it now, I think um, it probably you know got Hawthorne going a little bit in the following years because uh, Hawthorne were the ones in the rooms. Apparently, yeah, the apparently line Dermy, was drawn Dermy came down, and I think Dip was down in the rooms at half time and said, you know, you're <laughs> embarrassing yourselves, basically you know get something going and well they got something going and and it was on there's no doubt it was on and I remember I sort of flew in late um I think I got cleaned up on the way into the fight so I I hit the deck so I wasn't uh I wasn't too much help I remember getting up my head was on the side and I remember looking at um Mark Johnson Mark Johnson was actually quite a strong guy he loved his fight he actually loved his fighting was a good wrestler and and could fight only small but I remember seeing his face, and Nick Holland had him in a in a headlock that I'd never seen before. Had him locked fully in this in this headlock, and I remember looking over when I was on the ground, and his face was going purple. <laughs> and I thought, I've got to, you know, I've got to do something. He was a he was a fellow, you know, played in the back pocket, and was a good mate of mine. And I remember getting and trying to rip uh, Nick Holland his arm from around his neck, and I couldn't get him. I couldn't get him off. And I remember reaching in. Someone grabbed me at the time, and then I was sort of muck, you know, I was getting thrown around in the middle. But I remember, and I probably shouldn't say it, but I remember, oh, I couldn't do anything. And I remember grabbing Nick Holland's face and just trying to grab and rip something just to get him off because I thought John I was going to black out. It was that tight a tight a headlock, and I reckon I got a bit of, oh, I shouldn't say, a bit of eyes and a bit of mouth, <laughs> and I managed to sort of, you know, wig, wiggle him off a little bit, but. Um, it was a street fight. It was a street fight. You had to do it's, it. It's sort no of, rules. What well, sort of? Yeah, no rules. And it was a bit of UFC style. And um, <laughs> it, it, and it happened. And I think we we went on to win by sort of eight ten goals. So we won the game of footy. But uh, I think it did help Hawthorne change. You know, they 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 went about it. But uh, yeah, it's good to see. I love the old punch ons. You know what I mean? It's uh, that was you know what was footy all about back when I watched. Because you had another one, Essendon and Hawthorne. Lloyd, he came off the square and knocked out Brad Sewell. Yeah. Brad Sewell? Yeah, Brad Sewell. So I think it was might have been Lloyd's last game. I think it was. Um, yeah, he's, Lloyd, he's, uh, Sewell got sort of pushed a little bit and Lloyd he came through and got him, you know, f- really flushed him. And Was he a... Was he a uh, you spoke about Mark Johnson liking the fighting and boxing. Was Lloyd that sort of guy? Was he? Oh no, nah, not he had to learn. I reckon Lloyd had to learn. I remember, he, uh, and the turning point for him was I remember Steve Crediok used to play for the Western Bulldogs, and one day Lloyd had a broken couple of broken fingers played, and Crediok was just belting Lloyd's fingers. And I remember at half time, a couple of the old boys said, "Mate, something's got to give. You're looking, you know, you're getting." Shit's bashed. Yeah, you're getting bashed and you're not, it's not looking great. And from that day onwards, I reckon Lloyd, he sort of came out of his shell and written, I'm not saying he's a good fighter and he used to get in the ring and fight, but he knew and he got the nickname Velvet Sledgehammer, um, obviously <laughs> towards uh, his second part of his career. So I think he realised, you know, it would have been 95, 96 that, again, he was a, he was a young kid, St Bernard's, you know, didn't really, wasn't into fighting, not you have to be into fighting, but he couldn't get, you know, shit put on you. And he realised that quite early through, you know, Mark Harvey and a few of these guys that, um, you know, told him that message. But he just got sore flush. Um, I remember Lordy sort of saying I had to do something because we weren't playing well. Um, got him flush and, you know, knocked him out. It was quite a, it was quite a brutal sort of hit. But I remember that day uh, running it. Lordy sort of backed up when he hit him because all Hawthorne just went straight to Lordy. And I came in from real deep again from, uh, from full back. And I remember Lordy looking around thinking, geez, I need a bit of help. So I flew in that particular day and um, 
I'm not sure who Better I Better effort? Yeah. Did you end up? Not really. I used to fly in thinking I was bloody Mike Tyson <laughs> and, uh, and I was no good. I think Birchall, me and Birchall, Grant Birchall might have had a bit of a go for a little bit. Grant um, Birchall, he's not the biggest. Yeah, no, nah, I think I might have, oh yeah, I'm not sure. Pick one I, from yeah, the herd yeah, there. I'm not sure who I, who I picked, but uh, <laughs> but no, nah, they were bigs. So I remember Campbell Brown, you know, just guys like, he was bloody whacking blokes. Richie Vandenberg was teeing off a few guys. Jason Johnson, so... But they were big. You don't see it too much now, obviously, do you, nah. with, with, with that type of uh, footy. But uh, there was something about it that was that was good fun, you know what I mean? Everyone's looking after the back pocket too much. Every, <laughs> everyone's worried about getting fined yeah, too much. I was going to say, um, you don't really see a headlock in footy these days. Like, when's the last time you saw someone in a full-on headlock? Danny Southern put that, Peter Sumich yep. to sleep, didn't he? Yep. But, uh, on the, yeah. Yeah, this is like, yeah. F- funny story about this, right? So Just yeah. a little digress- uh, digression. Um, <laughs> Danny Southern. Choked Peter Sumich unconscious uh, out in Subi over one day. Wing there, wasn't it? And were um, people on him, like trying to get him off, or was yep. it just a one on? Okay. No, nah, it started one on one, and then Wusher was on him doing the uh, the, the face pull that Fletch uh, <laughs> coined, <laughs> and, and they couldn't get him off. He had him, he had him it's some sort lock. of monk move, and he was just locked on like a, like an anaconda. And Summer went unconscious, almost killed him. Very serious, and and West Coast people uh, not too happy about that incident. Anyway, f- fast forward to present day. Daddy Southern is the is the new West Australian AFLPA rep. So he he looks up to the West Coast players and the Fremantle fo- players. Right. Just to, I, I won't go too deep, but I don't don't think West Coast overly happy that the Anaconda <laughs> joke. <laughs> the, the, the 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 strangler, yep. the, the Subiaco strangler, is out there looking after their players. Um, so I remember Tony Lockett actually did it to a guy by the name of Brad Fox. This is about 1990, I reckon it was Essendon versus uh, St Kilda out at Waverley. Similar type, got him in, and I think he nearly. Uh, I remember Danny Frawley tell, used to tell the story that uh, he had to say to Plugger, "Mate, let go. You're gonna you're gonna kill this bloke." <laughs> So, yeah, so there's probably a couple of instances where the headlock uh, was into play. Um, so I do want to keep in footy. You, I'll, I'll go this way. You would have, in 22 seasons, you would have seen some footy trips, I assume, some Mad Mondays. You say your first Mad Monday, you went back to school the next day. Um, <laughs> have, you, have you been that sort of guy? You've been a footy trip guy? Oh. Oh, I have. I mean, you know, I know you I have. have been. Four, yeah, <laughs> all 23 seasons I played for, I went on 21 footy trips. Um, and I've got two kids, so there might have been one or two I did miss. Or they, towards the end of my career, they were getting a little bit you know, less and less, but we, we found a way. But uh, I enjoyed it f- just for the pure fact that you've got to go to, go away with your mates and and you know, have a few drinks. And was, was there a best one? Was there a, was oh, there a couple of good they ones? They were good. It's sort of towards the end of my career, or the young boys, Vegas, you know, we're going to Vegas, and I sort of got a bit sick of Vegas sort of five or six times in a row. But uh, <laughs> yes, sick of going to Vegas. But I remember two, uh, 2000 again. Um, so after the flag? After the flag. So we'd uh, had a good year. You know, there was money, was, there was money in the kitty because, um, yeah, it was just a big year, and we'd raised a bit of money, which, you know, you can't do now, but we had about 150K. <laughs> We had a lot of money in the. You know, What's the where's the money being um, built from? Like, it, oh, just a few of the boys. We had some fundraisers. You probably can't do it. Sportsman nights, yeah, couple, right, a couple right, of boots right, out right, of lockers right. get yeah, sold. Probably, you can't get. Flesh twist. doesn't have any jumpers yeah. from two thousand. Yeah, <laughs> not so much that. We just had fundraisers. Like we, you know, we sausage did. sizzle. Yeah, Adam, oh, Adam Simpson used to speak about it. North Melbourne's yeah. big thing was footy trip raising. Oh, that, they'd have all the members a, down. Yeah, it was a part of. We, right. we organised it, and we, you know, we had a. Again, probably get myself in trouble here, but we used to have gambling days. Like, you know, we'd come in and we'd have stuff set up, and we'd, you know, we'd do it in the right way. If you won, you won. If you lost, you lost. It was bad luck, but 150 grand. We had, the lot, we had a lot. Um, and anyway, I remember getting to the airport. This is a week, uh, probably two weeks after the grand final, thinking, "Geez, it's going to be a good trip." Uh, I wasn't sure where we're going. They said, it's, you know, "I said to one of the boys, where are we going?" He said, "Oh, we're not sure yet. You know, bring your bays. It's going to be hot." And I got to the airport, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, Berta said to me, he said, oh, um, you need your passport, obviously, we're going overseas. And I got there on the on the Monday morning and he said, uh, we're going to Ibiza. <laughs> and I said, oh, Ibiza, I'm not even sure where Ibiza is, so <laughs> fill me in where it is, but it's obviously an island off Spain in the, uh, I'm not sure what oceans it's in, but beautiful spot. But I remember flying from Melbourne to Brisbane, Brisbane to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Rome, Rome to Madrid, Madrid to Ibiza. So you can imagine we've got that much money in the in the kitty, but um, we've got the cheapest airfare of all time. It's taken us about four days to get to bloody Ibiza, <laughs> but we had oh, I think we had ten days in Ibiza, and we had uh, we came past Vegas on the way home. So 
which was stupid. To have ten days and ten days in Ibiza and seven in Vegas. You only need seventeen three. day footy trip. Yeah, no, oh, you, what's the longest you had? Oh, like three days is enough. You yeah. know, three days oh, is enough. Seven, ten. Oh, three days yeah. is enough. And I th- I'm not. Sure, and it just was what you know. I remember my first trip, 1994. We went to I think we went to San Francisco and Cancun, and the same. <laughs> it was 14 days. Like it was 14 days on a footy trip. How are you alive still? I can't drink for you know one or two days anymore. But it was 14 days of sort of tough going. But. Uh, but that 2000 trip was, mate, it was it was big. So you went uh, Ibiza, which is like l- live DJ capital of the world. Yeah. To Vegas, live yeah. gambling and live the biggest nightclubs in uh, the world again. Yeah, it was right. Like some of the uh, nightclubs in um, in Ibiza firstly were just, you know, there was two, three, four thousand people in these nightclubs. Like it wasn't though you could see a mate from the bar and say, oh, you know, get us a beer. Like... <laughs> There were bloody things being swing, you know. There was, <laughs> mate. It was all. It was all happening over there. It was a big footy trip. I think we ran into North Melbourne on that footy trip too. Yeah. So that was that was interesting there for a while. But um, yeah, it was a big footy trip, and I, I enjoyed it. It was it was good fun. What about your time? Um, you all Australian three times in your career. Uh, two, I think. Yeah, two. two yeah. Two thousand, two thousand seven. Yep. Um, chucked in a late one there. Yeah, late one. I think I was on the bench uh, in 2007. I remember that one for the fact being. I remember uh, my wife's English, so we used to go every you know break we had. We'd, we'd shoot off back over to England. I remember that one was uh, the you know the the event was like you know two or three weeks in, and I wanted to go away. And I remember thinking to myself, "Oh, I got invited, but you don't you know only the 60 people get invited, so you might not actually get in the in the all yeah. Australian." And I remember ringing someone up saying, "Oh, mate, is it worth me coming or not? Because I want to go. <laughs> you know, I want to go back home." And I remember the the message came back. Yeah, it's probably worth worth you going. So I stayed for that one. But yeah, I did make it on the bench. I think that year, and then two thousand was uh, was you know I was on the field probably as fullback. So that kind of uh, culminated in in the in the international rule series in the end. And yep. uh, I just remember you as a as a goalkeeper. You, you were you were the greatest goalie Australia's ever seen. That move yeah. over Mark Bosnich. Into yeah. Dustin oh, Fletcher. Yeah. yeah, well, I should have chased the dream over there in soccer. Would have been a bit. Uh, the money would have been a bit different. How does that uh, come about? Because you're a football oh, player, you're not a goalkeeper. Yeah, not a goalkeeper, and it came about by. And I'd been asked to play. To be honest, I'd been asked to play quite a few beforehand, but I never really did. I didn't really, you know, I wanted my time off and I wanted to travel and, and do that stuff. And and I remember Kevin Sheedy got the job as coach, and he rang me up. I was actually in England, and um, and he said, um, "I'm coaching. You know, you're playing." And well, I didn't say no to Sheed, so uh, so I stayed in England that particular day, that particular time, and you know I met the boys in Ireland, and and that started my uh, that started my international rules, and I ended up loving it. I just loved it. Like it was a different sport. Been playing footy for a long time to kick a round ball, to dive round, not have to run, yeah. um, to play in some big crowds at Croke Park. Passionate Irish people. Um, you spoke about lying in the sand. You know, we got into it in the... Chris we, uh, Johnson in the, Was it Chris yeah, Johnson just smacking on with... I reckon over here, Chris Johnson, I reckon, knocked a couple out over at Subi and then that was in Melbourne. And Subi Echo and then the return leg was in Melbourne. So he um, he got a couple that particular day. But it was more for the fact that the Irish, they, you know, they didn't... Um, they, they would pinch and poke and trip and do all those type of things, but they, they couldn't really sort of tackle. It's like when we bumped or tackled, we tackled you know, like AFL people do, but you don't tackle in their game. So every time they got tackled and thrown to the ground, you know, they got angry and they'd lose it. And that's sort of what started a fair bit of um, these fights. But they were in pretty good spirits, I sort of thought. Every now and then one or two might got it out of hand. I think when Fev gave the bloke a clip behind the bar in uh, in, in Ireland after a big day at the races, that probably uh, that probably didn't go down that well. Stop, but, um, please. No, please yeah. tell you. Were you there? Yeah, it was. Oh, tell, what happened? Tell me. We were at the races all day. We had a big day at the races. And I remember the ra- we had a big win too, a couple of big wins at the races. And we'd been there all day. And we got back to, to close into town. I think it was at um, Galway. Galway races, back into Galway. And we, we got back in there. And I remember we were going, went to a bar as you, as you do when it was about 11, 10, 11 o'clock. And I don't think it was as much to it as it sort of got blown up to be. But um, I remember Fev ordering a beer and, and the bloke, I think oh, a few of us, would, we'd had a few and basically said, mate, you've had too many, go home. And I don't think Fev liked that, <laughs> told, been told to go home. So, uh, And I think I was me and uh, Barry Hall were captain that year. So um, anyway, he sort of gave him, I don't think he actually whacked him. It was more a bit of a headlock and said, you know, <laughs> get, get, get that beer into us and, uh, and we'd be right. But um, I think Fev actually got, I voted for him to stay. I was the only one on the... I voted for him to stay, but I think he ended up getting sent home that uh, that particular day and didn't get to play a game. But uh, 
Yeah, but they were big trips. Hang on, so this was before the games were played. Oh, this was before the game. Yeah, this was uh, <laughs> this was a couple of days, or a week, or not even a week, a couple of days before. But uh, it was uh, was was good fun. Probably not a good way to convince the bartender to pour you a drink is to get him in a headlock. Nah, well, I think he sort of got him in the headlock and just managed to pour his own. So I think it was <laughs> he uh, he had it uh, he had it covered. Oh, Pre game as yeah, well. Yeah. You um, yeah. we've mentioned some big big forward names. Um, who was the the toughest that you had to come up against? Oh, I'll give you three, and they've all kicked over a thousand goals, and it was early. Dunstall, Ablett, Lockett, and I probably go back to Jason Dunstall, and I think I mentioned it before. When I started, it was it was a full forward on the full back, and we'd very rarely leave the twenty five meters out from goal. They just sort of locked you into that spot. They'd clear everyone out, and you would have come a, you oh, yeah. would have come a, across it. And it was it was tough to play Darren Jarm and guys like that just putting the ball out in front at the old Waverley Park it was a massive ground and. It was two hours of just trying to halve contest, trying to spoil and just trying to survive. And um, between those three, um, just talented, talented footballers. Did you have did you have ways you used to like obviously you did preparation on your players, but were you a back shoulder guy? Were you were you a front shoulder? Were you I know yeah. you had reach on yeah. players and you had speed. How do you used to match it with these guys that were clearly yeah. Stronger than you, right? Because I don't know how much time nah, you spent in the gym. Nah, you do it like me. Nah, so it's 79 kilos. It wasn't sort of going down too well against 120. Um, <laughs> Tony Lockett would have been all of 115 kilos. So, yeah, you, you hit on the head. I, I used my speed and reach. That was the things that I had that I that I used. But the problem was Jason Dunstall, Tony Lockett were all quick as well. So even though I was quick, I had to sort of play off them so they didn't get any... You know, they couldn't actually sort of grab me or, or get hold of me. So I sort of was back shoulder, but I'd sort of play back shoulder enough that they couldn't actually push me off. So I was giving myself about a metre and a bit so they couldn't get me off and I still could go with them. But, you know, if you miss your sort of step and it'd be an easy mark. So, but yeah, it was, it was tough, tough. Did um, you have any um, little tricks that you would, you know? Oh, not really. Bullshit. Um, yeah, I... Oh, I, I tried to, there were a couple of instances here where Gary that would hold you out and I'd, sometimes I'd be spoiling with my foot. I'd be trying to kick the ball when it was actually in midair. You just had to <laughs> spot yeah, it. There's a, fa- there's a famous photo where, you know, um, Gary Albert's got, he's basically got me out and I remember my, my legs coming through to actually kick the, kick the ball away. So I actually spoiled it with my foot. But, uh, <laughs> but I got thrown around, mate. I tell you, I got thrown around. Alistair Lynch. Um, yeah, the list, uh, the list goes on. You would have, um, have any big hangers taken on you? Yeah, no doubt I did. Um, Tony <laughs> Modra, um, actually Matthew Lloyd took, took one on me one day, so an own teammate of mine took one on me, but yeah, you're always in the footage when, um, yeah. uh, I think Billy Brownless took, Gary Ablett took a big one on me one day, so um, yeah, the problem was we didn't get the car, did we? The, uh, the bloke <laughs> who took the mark on got the car. He got so. many guys' cards. Yeah, cars. but uh, I did, yeah, I'd have a few big marks taken on me. What about towards the back end of your career? Um, it plays a part, doesn't define your career clearly, but it does play a big part. Um, uh, Essendon, uh, James Hurd, favourite son returns, starts coaching the club. You know, first of all, what's that relationship like? An ex teammate is your head coach. Yeah, from an individual sense, it was good for me, um, and I say that because I was, you know, friends with Hurd. He played footy, great player, and all that type of stuff. But he went when he came back to coach. I was coming to the end, and um, I probably thought to myself, you know, I don't want to let the bloke down. I don't want to put him in the under pressure to. You know, if I wasn't performing, to actually have to drop me in the in the reserves. So I actually got pretty fit like that. When Hurdy came back as coach, it was probably one of my bigger pre-seasons. Which, what year was that? Uh, that was, what, that would have been 2011. Okay. Was it 2011? Oh, don't quote me on it. I'm just thinking back to... Yeah, can have a look. Yeah, when it was. But, yeah, so I sort of... Um, I sort of... Yeah, from that sense, it was good for me. Um, um, and he's, he was going to be a good coach, there's no doubt. We did, probably didn't see that in the end. But um, from an individual sense, it was it was going to be good for me. Because he was a, a legend of the game. He, the, his, his playing ability. Yeah. And, and a good leader. Yeah, was, that's oh, great. As a, as a player. Great leader as a player and, you know, someone with pretty high morals and was, was a fantastic... Uh, 2011. 2011, yeah, it was 2011. Because obviously things turned pear-shaped a bit after that but uh but I thought he you know he was he did coach really well and he's you know obviously learn off Sheeds and I, you know Sheeds was my main coach for I think over 285 games so I think he could have been a good coach well I've been following AFL for a long time and and um you know full disclosure you and I did a did a uh show together last night and he spoke about the supplement saga which I, I know quite a lot of guys personally that were involved I think Ben Howlett was involved uh, towards the, the back end there's uh, Corey Delelio was, was yeah. a guy on the Essendon list at the time there was quite a few Western Australian guys caught up in it 
but I haven't really heard a lot of people speak about it. I don't know if there's been uh, legal embargoes or just people don't want to speak about it, but I f- heard from you first last night about some details around it. So I wondered if you'd be comfortable sharing uh, a bit about that because it, it went on for a long yeah. time as well. Can you speak yeah. to, to sort of what yeah. went on? So so what happened in the short version, I'll give you the short version, it went on for four or five years, which was, which was way too long. Um, but... I, you know, I think obviously heard he came across to coach uh, Bomber Thompson, being the senior assistant, realised we had to train hard, we had to get fitter, stronger. Bomber had a fair bit of success with Geelong, obviously with the side he had down there. So I think they knew we had to train. Our preseason had to be hard, and we had to we had to do the hard work, which which was fine. And then um, we got Stephen Dank across, um, who was f- sort of came across what I remember it as a sports scientist type guy with more with GPS sort of things and was a very smart man. So he came across as well. Dean Robinson. Um, the weapon. The weapon. Um, I think How did he, he get the weapon? Oh, I think he gave himself the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> he, I think he ran with the weapon, but he was a big guy. He was a, he was a, he was a menace. He was a big, big guy. So he came across as wage coach. So we were getting flogged in the gym, on the track, all that type of stuff. The supplement program was started. Um, we sort of sat as a, as a group and we saw what was about to happen and we weren't sure, I must admit, we weren't sure about it. Um, we, sh- we just had to make sure that whatever we were going to take, if we were going to you know, in- be involved in the program, that we had to get it ticked off on. And we we actually got the program ticked off on by you know various sort of you know various sort of people ticked off on the program. So we sort of felt comfortable, which was uh, with what was going to happen, even though being injected was was new to me. I'd been injected in games, but it was more through um, you know when I was pain relief, like, like, pain relief, yeah. like I'd had a lot of injection, you know, all that type of stuff. So I'd been injected before, but never really for for what you know this this was to be. So. I must admit, I was a little bit n- nervous, not nervous of the fact that I was doing anything wrong, but nervous that, you know, it was something a little bit new and, and we were going to go with it. So, but when it was ticked off on and, and the players realised that, you know, we'd, we'd sort of done our homework on it, we were, you know, what was going to happen, what was going to happen. But uh, I think I'm on record of having, you know, 38 injections during that time. And a lot of the injections I had were sort of for, you know, post-game recovery, like you get a drip in with, you know, salts and have things put back in your body that way, which was obviously legal and the AOD and all that type of stuff. I wasn't really over the top of it and I wasn't sort of part of, you know, I don't think I was involved in that. Not that I'm not sort of putting myself away from it. I was involved in the program well and well and truly. So, but it started and it got a little bit, when I say a little bit out of hand, it sort of got a little bit, um, you know, the probably the business, well not say the business side of it, you know, the records sort of weren't being kept and it became a little bit, uh, and Essen made, there's no doubt Essen made mistakes and, you know, I think the AFL made mistakes and, and I think there's no doubt that Asada sort of, you know, they struggled with with the whole program. So, but it became just a, in the end, I think Essen self-reported, or we did self-report, um, for the fact being, I think the AFL wanted to have a look at what was what was happening, and and from that day that we did self-report, it was, you know, it was it was massive. Um, so in, so it goes from getting ticked off effectively by. The playing group, because I'm putting, trying to put myself in the same position. You know, something gets presented, all the boys would leave the room, going, oh, yeah. "What the fuck's that? What's going on there?" Yeah, that was so, that was pretty much it. So you go and speak to the AFLPA, yeah. the AFL, yeah. Asada, and effectively get it ticked off. Yeah. To how much further down the track is it when Essendon self-report? Because yeah, oh yeah, I think it was a fair way down that fair bit. 12, 12 months. Oh, or, probably, I'd be guessing yeah. it'd be four or five months down the track that yeah. uh, we sort of self-reported. So. And that's not to say that, you know, there are obviously a few things that maybe were on site that, you know, weren't right. Um, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, that they might have been giving it to different people that were sort of coming through the place. So that whole look was was terrible. I, you know, I, I agree with that. But, you know, the 34 players, I'll give them credit. And a lot of Perth guys, you know, you speak about the guys you just mentioned that, um, that it had an effect on. And, um, you know, there was over, I'm not sure how many tests, but over six 700 tests and there was not one positive test. Uh, I think there was, you know, I don't even think I was tested during that time. So to feel like you get the biggest fine in AFL history, to kick out of the finals, for it to go on for four years, lose draft picks, you know, cost the club, you know, a lot of money. It was pretty tough to take and, you know, we, you know, we were found not guilty and we thought we were all right and then the case gets heard in Switzerland, goes over to get hurt in Switzerland um, and, yeah, we get we get found guilty. It was a, it was a, it was a big shock and... It affected a lot of people. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, in, in bad ways. So it was a tough period of my footy career because I felt, you know, I was an honest guy. I played footy for two reasons. I loved the game, 
and I love just trying to beat my opponent out there. You know, not if I had to cheat in any way, I would have walked off the ground and not com- not competed. So that's sort of my and I'm a pretty honest, you know, guy, and you know, Dad's the same. My family are sort of we're like that as well. So I sort of still feel that you know I've got a tick against my name, which I can't still. I've got to cop it, but I've, I don't. I don't like it. Lance Armstrong, all these guys, you know, they've still got the tick on their name, and I've still got one. Joe Watson, you know, still hasn't got a brown low. So tough, tough. But uh, yeah, we're sort of through it now, and it's good to see that um, you know we're talking about footy and just just playing footy because it was a long time. Did Did you feel better like with the supplements? Like, did you feel like oh man, like we were, were you feeling in better shape? And oh, no, I, no, I didn't feel in bit me. I didn't. I didn't feel any effects of it, you know, at all. Um, and too, there are a lot of times with the sup, not just with the injection part, the supplements that I didn't really, you know, like I'd get the supplements given to me just in tablets, you know, just like uh, whatever was given. And and I sort of after um, you know a couple of weeks, I thought you know this is not doing me well, and I just sort of left it there and didn't really, you know, didn't really go on with it. So I, but oh yeah, I'd have to say there's no, um, I've had ne- any negative effects from from the program, and I didn't think it um, it helped me m- help me one bit. Which yeah. you spoke about last night that you were one of eight players that weren't drug tested over that period. So uh, assuming the other guys something was in their system, not illegal though, but you were never drug tested. So effectively, have you been charged and lumped in on? hearsay effectively or your own evidence if you weren't oh, drug tested because yeah. the reason why you weren't drug tested and I'll, I'll talk to it is at AFL level uh, this is across the competition Asada comes in West Coast they used to have a ball ba- a bag of balls and y- they used to randomly pick numbers yeah. out and if 31 never comes out Dustin and I are both number 31 yeah. if it doesn't come out you don't get drug tested so I went through periods of my career I wasn't tested for three years in a row but then I had one year, I, I was tested six th- times. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So you weren't tested over that period, and yeah. there was a few other guys in the same boat. Yeah, I think there was eight of us that uh, I think it's on record of that. You know, we weren't, and not, I'm not sure the period. It wasn't the f- sort of the full year, but that 2011 through that bit, it was just by chance. You know, you didn't get named, didn't get drawn out, and you're right. You might get tested sort of three times in three weeks. It's just how it, it sort of it might be different. I think it's different now, but uh, but yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I think uh, the, the short answer is every 30, every one of those thirty four guys were basically there were, weren't different penalties for different guys. It was thirty four guys were a group, um, and I think that that was the problem. No one really had dealt with a group of thirty four players. And I'll give the the boys credit. We you know we're we're actually a really close group. The whole thirty four players for for what we went through and. Um, yeah, we never splintered. We were always, you know, Job. I suppose Joe Watson was a face. A lot of the press conference always came back to Job, and he spoke really well at all those. And um, yeah, we've we're all sort of we never went with different legal representation. We all stuck together, and and that was a good part of uh, of those, you know, thirty four mates that uh, that were part of the program. You speak about some careers getting ended or affected, or you know, guys move clubs, that sort of stuff. Does Joe Watson getting his brownlow stripped away? How does that sit with you? Oh, it doesn't sit well with me, and I've never spoken to Job about it, but um, you know, I'd fa- fairly say that it wouldn't probably sit well with him as well. But, um, yeah, I, like I I reckon he's a, he's a Brownlow medalist in my book, and, you know, he's, he's not going to take that away from the way I think about it. But, you know, e- everyone had a different story. You know, we were found not guilty, and I remember Stuart Cramery, who played with us, had a really good couple of seasons at the Essendon Footy Club, and when we were found not guilty, he thought, I still need a break. You know, I'm going to go to another club, totally new start. So we found not guilty. He went to the Western Bulldogs. You know, come two or three weeks later, we ended up getting found guilty and the penalties were put in place. So Kramers went from Essendon Footy Club to the Western Bulldogs and this would be 2015, 2016. Um, he got there as just a new start, going to have a good year, strong, good player, great fella. Um, and in the end, we got found guilty. Um, the Bulldogs go in, go and have a fantastic season 2016, have a great final series and win a premiership. Kramers misses that chance. This is just an individual. You could, I could speak about the other guys. but uh, So Kramers goes on there to have a few injuries. I think he goes to Geelong and has a year of footy up there, but basically doesn't play too many more games of footy from that time. And he could have been a premiership player. And we play footy to play in premierships and play in finals. And that's just one story that, uh, you know, I feel for him because, you know, not too many, not, not too many people realise that Kramers was a, was a good footballer, but in the end, not a premiership player and didn't, didn't play a lot of footy after that, uh, that so Yeah, it affects more than just Essendon, right? It yeah, affects oh, people that's individually, right. yeah, it families. Does, yeah, um, yeah and, and yeah, uh, thanks for talking about it, honestly, no, it's good. I um, wanted to finish on a couple of last ones before we get to social media, Fletch. So social media, 
you just come with me there, it's just beautiful use of I word like there. It. So it's that's where the fans get to ask you the questions. You've heard enough from Dan and I. A couple of last ones. One, long sleeves. You still wear the long sleeves a bit. Oh, a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Not much. I remember, oh, I can answer it. Friday night we had a Collingwood game and um, freezing. Cold, one of the coldest days I've ever been involved in. My fingers were gone. I was <laughs> blue running out. Had the long sleeve on. We all went out. Half the side, more than half wore long sleeve this particular first half against Collingwood. MCG Friday night. We come in and we're 10 goals down at, at half time. And you speak about sheety sprays and... He absolutely he tore strips off and said, "Mate, half the team, more than half the team, are wearing long sleeve jumpers, mate. It's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment." <laughs> so he went and got the ten um, short sleeve shirts, <laughs> threw them at us, and said, "You're wearing them. You're not wearing that. You know, you you go on ordinary." So I didn't wear from from that point on. Didn't didn't, didn't wear a long sleeve. Uh, I probably wore one beforehand just to cover up uh, cover up my muscles, mate. I didn't have. Uh, I was quite squ- skinny, but uh, that didn't work out too well either. Oh, that's funny. And the last one I want to ask you about your sons playing. Over American football. They're both punters. So you, you were known for a bit of a long kick. I think you kicked one from 80 metres one day straight through the middle. Yeah. The boy, yeah. That's what the boys are taking. Little chip off the old bot. They've got a leg on them. Yeah, they've got a good leg on them. Um, they, had a, they had a bit of a go at footy. We're okay footballers. Mason had a few stress fractures through his back, being a tall kid. Decided he wanted a bit of a different challenge and thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll jump on the journey over there. So... He does. He did pro kick for. Um, he was pretty lucky. He got a he got a, a scholarship deal pretty quickly, and um, he managed to go to a, a school in uh, University of Cincinnati in Ohio, and uh, he was true freshman last year. Had a great great year. Or the team had a great year. He had a pretty good year as well. Punting um, went on. I think they're our only undefeated team in America. Um, until they got to the uh, to the big one, they won their conference um, championship, which was great. So they made the final four in the country, didn't they? Four in the country, yeah. So they managed to scrape into fourth, which for Cincinnati, it's never been you know that was it's never been done before. But uh, the problem was they play Al- uh, they played Alabama, and I right. got there for that game at um, at Dallas A uh, and E or AT and T, whatever stadium it was a was a big game, but. Uh, they got beaten by Alabama, who are a class outfit, a lot of five star recruits and on, on every line. So so yeah, so Mason had a great year at Cincinnati and our youngest has just gone over as well, gone to a big school in the SEC, uh, University of uh, Arkansas, which is in Fayetteville. So they play all against the big guys in their conference. So they've got a very tough conference. But um, yeah, they're learning the way over there. They're working hard. Um, you've got to work hard because you've got to pass your schooling before you play footy. Right. So uh well, at least they tell me they're working hard. I'm, uh, I'm not Couple sure. A couple of Australians over in college football. Yeah, life. Well, yeah. Are they, they living in dorms or they? Li- well, yeah, well, they they do live in dorms, but um, you know, it's not traditional. What you think? It's you know, five in a dorm, and it's an old style, just out the back there. You know, they live in nice. They're nice apartments, and you know, they have got a pool and gym, and you know, pretty new sort of you know living. So they live pretty well. But again, you've got a. It's a big move. You know, Max is my youngest, pretty quiet sort of kid. So. He's over there working hard. Um, the Americans, uh, they're pretty confident, you know what I mean, with, with, with their programs. But they, they work hard. Mason's put on, he's put on about 15, 16 kilos in his, in his wow. first year. And, and Max has already put on five or six. He's only been there about three or four months. Because it's brutal. Because there's one punter in one team. It's not like yeah. Aussie rules, there's six backmen on the field, maybe another one on the bench and you Got you a might chance get to get moved s- forward if yeah, 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 if you're playing, it's yeah, one punter. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, where Max is, there's five punters on the, the well, there's punter kickers or there's four or five, you know, reasonable punters on that side. So Max is obviously trying to beat these other guys within the side, so he gets a job as punter. So, oh. but yeah, you're right. It's brutal if you mess up a kick or you, you know, even as a quarterback, you mess up a few throws or you do something wrong. Well, you know, you could sit on the bench for the next six, seven. We've months. actually got a connection to the University of Arkansas. Our girl that works with us here at Back Chat, Indy, was on a scholar- soccer scholarship at no, the University no. of Arkansas. Yeah. So she couldn't make it in today, but she I oh, put that go. in our little thread and she said, Arkansas, that's my school. Yeah. Oh, what what are they? What's their, what's their, like the Cincinnati Bearcats? What, yeah. What's the, yeah, what's the Arkansas? Razorbacks. The Razorbacks. 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 You, you got some good merch there? You get oh, the, yeah, my, yeah. We, well, I said, I haven't been to, I haven't been to um, Arkansas yet, but uh, we're going out. September 3, they actually play each other. Um, first time no. in so many years that they've been out of conference games because they because they don't meet each other all the time. Ever. Nah, no, nah, it's just by chance. So they're in wow. a different conference, but they play out of out of conference games. So September three, we're over there. We'll get over and um, yeah, oh, my wife will be yeah, she'll be buying half the merchandise <laughs> in bloody, uh, in Cincinnati and then Arkansas. But uh, we look forward to that trip. Who will you go for? Oh, well, well. Yeah, my wife, she's already on it. She wants to get the, the jerseys made up half and half. But, um, yeah, oh, 
might be a bit ruthless here. Whoever wins, I'll be going. For <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'll, be, I'll be going for both. They're, no, they're yeah. both good kids. Nah, nah, stuff that. Yeah. 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 Pick on. Yeah. We hope they both punt well and they have a good game and they don't get injured. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Wasn't Mason doing the Conor McGregor walk off in that game? He did. He did a. He, he punted pretty well in the, in the big last two games. He punted really well, which was a good sign. He can, you know, he punts under pressure. That was really good. But uh, yeah, the game I got to in uh, in Dallas, oh mate, you know, eighty odd thousand there, and he's kicked a pretty good punt to keep Alabama back. And thought the Pat McAvee sort of Conor McGregor strut he's done, and uh, he's quite still quite skinny, even though he's put on the weight. So. Yeah, you can imagine the uh, the media. It got on a that. bit of coverage. Yeah, I got a bit of coverage. Pat, and didn't Pat? Yeah, he got Pat it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And he gave him a bit that. of a wrap up, but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a bit different. Must, must have been my wife's side. I wasn't. I probably wouldn't be strutting <laughs> around like that. But, uh, yeah. uh, all, right. all right, I think it's time for social media. Let's do it. Um, this is where the fans we put a little post up yesterday. Once we confirm you are coming into the house, and they get ask you the questions. Fletch, are you ready? Ready to go. All right. I'm just gonna, I haven't read any of those, so we're just yeah, going to go straight into it. Yeah. Kane Burt, double underscore. Love the double underscore, Kane. Oh, very good stuff. Uh, if you were to construct the best starting 22 based on all players you've played with, what would your starting team be? <laughs> well, let, let's not go – you don't have to go all 22, but, you know. What about a spine? Yep. Oh. What yeah. about a spine of players you've played with? Essendon players. Yeah. So full forward, centre-half forward, ruck, centre-half back and full back. Oh, yeah, you so put yourself at full back? Yeah, I'll put myself in. Uh, <laughs> Sit half back, jeez. The thing is, I've played with over 180 <laughs> plays, you know what I mean? So to, to remember yesterday, but there's no doubt Matthew, oh, Matthew Lloyd. Matthew Lloyd, be, but you know, yep. Paul Salmon, he kicked yes. that many goals, was, was great. You know, James Hurd as a traditional centre half forward, maybe. Terry Danaher, 92, sort of missed him, but would have loved to play with Terry, so I'd, I'd, I'd have him in there. Guy I'd, I'd put on, not on the spine, but Mark McCurry. People forget Mark McCurry. He was. Almost won the Brown, though, that year, oh, didn't he? Just a special player. I remember speaking to Guy McKenna when he was at Eston saying, Guy McKenna, he said that Mark McCurry was the hardest player he ever played on. Yeah. And he was a gun. Um, yeah. Oh, who do I put, you know. I'm, oh, I'm a bit random here, but you know Sean Wellman. Like Sean, we couldn't have got away with Sean Wellman. With he was one of my best players I ever played with. He was probably centre half back, but you know we've had some great centre half backs as well. Uh, oh, I'm forgetting blokes here. Michael Long. Uh, I know it's not yeah. the spine on the wing. I'd put him in the centre just because he had that run. Gavin Wanganeen won the Brownlow '93, um, so it's not really a spine or it's a spine with a bit of a. You've bit played of, with some players yeah, though. A bit haven't of bendy you? The oh, spine, how, how fortunate. I had to look back yeah. at some of the guys you've played yeah, with. They were great, yeah. They're all I'll, I'll just jump to this before, yeah, you, before you ask this question because this was a stat we didn't get to before. So 1,972 people have made their debut in the time between your first game and your last game. So 1,972. And uh, 1,333 of them finished their careers before you finished yours. It's it, a lot of people. It so is. So you played yeah. against and with a lot. Of it is. And, and I think, and you probably know the stat, but I think the average AFL player drafted 18, let's just say you're not drafted 18, you know, by 21 and a half, they're actually at three and a half years is your average yep. AFL contract. So to play for 23, you need some luck. You need to be able to work hard, all that type of, bit of, you know, resilience and all that type of stuff. But uh, you do need that little bit of luck with injuries. Oh, I mean, like I see here today, I think like 14 years, I happily, if, if Dustin Fletcher's not sitting right there, it's a, Great, like a long career, very long career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I look like I look like I didn't try well, he, that. He I said, do. He said, like on the second half of my career, about eleven years in, I was like, that's like <laughs> more than most guys play. Uh, man, it's incredible. Uh, okay. Matt, Matt, cut back. Uh, okay, uh, I knew my partner was the one for me when I walked into the lounge room and she was watching a compilation of Fletcher's longest barrels. <laughs> <laughs> might the be the <laughs> might be the partner for me. <laughs> <laughs> Is the top underutilized in today's game? Oh. Uh, Oh, I think it is. I love kicking tops. And you've seen oh, from it's, uh, Oregon's coming back a little bit. I think Shannon Hearn, you know, are obviously over this way. Shannon, Lewis Jett, I reckon, used to be able yep. to get onto a real top. So we had one year where he was allowed to kick him it, as well. He was allowed but to kick it. That's what the goal is, isn't it? The yeah. coach has got to let yeah. you do it a bit. Don't yeah, they? that's right. I think Zach Tui said I, I was, he's kicked a couple of big tops. And you kick one, you get away. And I had the same. If I kick one and got onto it, I'd go for two. If I kick two, I'd go for three. Three for four. I used to test it a little bit. But. Yeah, I think if you can kick him, I think you kick him because you can get you, um, you can get over the back of the pack, get your distance from out of the back line. Maybe not a shot at goal. It's a little bit uh, hard to kick a goal. Steaming with one, but through the middle and kicking a seven. Yeah, but yeah, I goal. think it's yeah. I'd love, mate. If I could kick torpedoes every day of the week, I wouldn't <laughs> even kick a drop punt. <laughs> Freo underscore hub. Oh, we love the boys at the Freo hub. They're doing good things over there. Uh, do you think Mundy can break the four hundred game milestone? Um, what's he on three fifty five? I reckon, Mundy I reckon he's about there. Um, oh, the way he's playing, I'll say yes. Um, I must admit, uh, the 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 guys that do travel across, 
you know, I've heard perhaps I've heard a few players speak about, it and I agree with it. Like I think you could nearly say three hundred games for for someone over here is is worth four hundred. Yeah, three sixty three is on. Oh, three sixty three. So will you do your maths, probably. He's to play some finals this year. Some finals this year, maybe a year, maybe two he's, years. He's played two more seasons. Two more seasons. Yeah, so I think, yes, Scott Penelbury, I think, is up there. But um, I'd love to see Davey, David Mundy do it because he's a, I think he's a Melbourne boy too, isn't he? He's from up, uh, yeah, he's he's from up Kilmore. Yeah, country, 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 boy, country so, boy. And a fantastic guy. So I'll say, yes, there will be a All few right. more. Oh, very good. Uh, Raz underscore 894. Uh, like most defenders, do you think you would have been a great forward if given the chance? <laughs> Having kicked three goals five times, it's a lot for a fullback. Um, in your career, I would suggest you had a, a knack for playing up front. Oh, I'd love to say yes and put myself up. But oh, how bloody easy is <laughs> yeah, up in the forward line, yeah. tell you what. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe. No, maybe. I think it's easier. And I'll, I'll say it's easier, I think, you know, playing sort of in the back line where yep. you can see the ball coming. You know what I mean? You've just got to kick it that way. It to definitely turn. is. It's definitely easy. So I, I'd say yeah, I would have loved to play a little bit more to test myself out and see if I could play full forward. But... Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not. You could have kicked him from the back line anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, the only shots I got, I got were from 60 out. And if I got <laughs> close, I tried to kick it. So Connor Morrissey Music has this one. We sort of touched on it a little bit, but I don't know if there was any other memories. Uh, what you remember about the night Lekkers kicked 12? Lacra? Yeah. Lekkers, you reckon? Lekkers. Lacra? Yeah. Lacra. 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 Yeah. Oh, just for the fact it played on him for a little bit. Every time he touched it, it was a goal. It looked round goal. It was one of those days where we played, uh, I dare say, there were six or seven guys that had a goal on him. And great player, um, didn't like playing, I played on him, I actually met, manned him a few times when they didn't have a taller forward and he was just a terrific player, natural footballer, I always think natural footballers knew, who knew where the goals were, were the toughest to play on and he was one of those. Yep, good, um, this is down towards the bottom mate, Shane Haddo. Uh, Shane Haddo, should there be a Golden Fist award for the best defender in the league? Yeah, I think there should, um, obviously the, the Brownlow's a, you know, basically a midfielder's award and um, the forward has got a Coleman medal, um, and you know from what I know, you know what Danny Frawley's sort of, you know what he's sort of left us with is, um, mate. I think there should be an award for. Uh, there probably could be one on every line. We sort of got that anyway, I, f- I believe. But uh, I reckon you need a, an award for the for the best backman. I mean, last one. It seems like an obvious one, but maybe we can change it to: Was there a chance you get picked yeah. up by someone else? But Sam underscore Dubano. Yeah, he asks: Did you have a team you're hoping to get drafted to? Was but it Essendon? Yeah, I was probably Essendon because Dad played. Was I, there anyone else that could have? I picked probably up? had the chance to go two thousand and one. No, again, nothing like a you don't see a ten year deal or anything like that. Yeah. You know, but it was a year or two maybe to go to. There was one chance to go to Carlton, and the other one was Port Adelaide. So only sort of yeah, minor sort of talks about it at the time. They probably didn't think I was going to leave, and I didn't in the end. But uh, probably two clubs that uh, had the chance to go to. Wow. It feels like a, a lot of people we ask you know that they've had chances to go to other teams. Port Adelaide's always in there. Like are they just yeah. always on the prowl? Yeah, I don't know what I don't it know was. What it is. Well, Port got Gav. I'm not sure when Gav left to go to Port Adelaide, but uh, well, they got a flag in 2000 and oh, four, whatever, whatever year it was. So Hardwick as well. Um, Hardwick. Oh, um, oh, who else? Paddy Ryder. Um, yeah. We've had a lot come this way too. Fremantle, obviously, with the sort of Scott Harvey connection. Scott, and yeah, yeah. It's got him last set from West Coast. Yeah, yeah. 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 They just maybe there's always on the prowl for players. Yeah. That's it, mate. Done and dusted. So. Dustin Fletcher, mate, we appreciate you coming in. Legend. Know you're a busy man here with Mouse Promotions. Give Mouse <laughs> a little shout out. We still give Mouse a shout out. <laughs> Mouse is yeah. a, good, he's a good man, but we appreciate you coming in, mate. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Blue Bet, uh, Whipper Snapper. I'm gonna we're gonna sort you out with a bottle of whiskey, mate. You oh, drink, nice. drink whiskey? Yeah, I do. I okay, do. Whipper Snapper whiskey is coming Dustin too. Fletcher's way. Shelter, the boys down there at Bustled and doing great things down there. Margaret River Roasting Co. Got the uh, coffee machine in the background. So if you need any coffee, we can sort that out too. They look after us. If you want to find us, you know where to do that. Backchat double underscore on social media. You can find us on the website backchatpodcast.com.au. You want to send us something? Hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. If you want to send us social media, follow us over on Instagram. Mm-hmm. If you want to watch this, we're on YouTube, Backchat. If you want to listen, you're already listening to it. <laughs> Hopefully I'm still here another 400 games just like Dustin Fletcher. We're done, Dustin. Dustin. <laughs>